morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see your smiling face on the, this beautiful sunny day. It is. Absolutely. And we start today with the lighting of the Christ candle and the pouring of the water. And I need a volunteer. Since I was last there. Last year. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it works. Yeah, you know your place. <laughs> God, light of the world. <laughs> Maybe. Jesus, living water of life. Holy Spirit, power divine, we praise your holy name. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We acknowledge the um, <clears throat> traditional territory. For thousands of years, indigenous people have walked in this land on, our, on their own country. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, specifically the Chippewa, Ojibwa, and Potawatomi people, past, present, and emerging leaders. We also respect their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. <clears throat> May we promise and challenge ourselves to make truth and reconciliation real in our community of faith here and in our daily lives. Bethune and Knox United Church are a safe place for all people to worship, regardless of race, creed, age, cultural background, or sexual orientation. May we honor one another and honor life itself. And the famous Indigenous Canadian that we are talking about today is Chief Dan George. Dan George born 24th of July, 1899, died 23rd of September, 1981. Chief Dan George. For the first 60 years of his life, Dan George held a number of jobs, and from 1951 to 63, he was chief of the Watu Nation. His acting career began with roles in Canadian theatre and Canadian and American television series. In 1970, he became the first Indigenous actor to be nominated for an Academy Award as Best Supporting Actor in the hip, hit mute movie, Little Big Bad. He appeared in other successful movies, including Harry and Tonto, 1974, and The Outlaw Josie Wales, 1976. George brought intelligence, dignity, and humor to his roles, thereby inviting viewers to reconsider past portrayals of Indigenous people. And now we will let have sharing our joy, concerns, announcements. Diane? This coming Wednesday at 1 o'clock, UCW and Thomas Hall. Uh, for all of those who can make it, that would be great. And before that, on Monday evening, it's the Lions Drive-By for the grads, for the grade 8 and grade 12s. So if you're available and can come, uh, meet in the arena parking lot just before 6.30. The drive-by starts at 6.30, and the students and families will be lined up along Main Street, and we'll get to go by and hoot and holler and congratulate them. So please attend if you can. Thank you. Our gathering him is Hey Nay Yana.
Mark calls us together as a community listening to his, this moment. We incline our ears. ears. God calls us together as a community listening to what matters. We are ready to listen. God calls us together as a community listening to what is true. We have come to hear the good news proclaimed. Together in this community, we will hear so much. God calls us together to listen again. Let us pray. Holy One, you incline your ear and listen to every joy and sorrow. Whisper and shout and sing your promise to us again, so that, filled to the brim with your good news, we can share in your hope again and again as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now let's join our voices.
Whether you take what is written in the Bible as fact, metaphor, myth, or story, listen to these words now for the meaning they hold for you on this day. And Janet will play the responses down song once and then we will sing it. One sixteen. Okay. Oh, Psalm one sixteen. Okay, so you give me the number. Page, page eight three six. Yeah. Bruce got his glasses. Got it. He got his glasses. All right. Oh, that's the worst part. Eh? Nobody came to your rescue. No, no, no. You're on your own. You're on your own. <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, um, I think. 
think I would say um, that coming up here to live was probably when I first when it first crossed my mind was probably felt definitely felt impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it made me laugh. Mm -hmm. I read it. Uh, I read a, an ad in the newspaper when I was in, at Five Oaks in Paris, and I was sitting myself. I was sitting by myself in a room, totally empty otherwise, and that was my choice. I wanted to get away from everything. And here's this ad that says they wanted teachers in Muskoka, oh, yeah. and it went through my mind. I thought, hey, I think I'll and just see what happens. <laughs> and then I started to laugh. I thought, this is ridiculous. There are so many things against it. Mm -hmm. However, work? here I am. Yay! Yeah. 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 And we're glad. Yeah. And we're still laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I can still laugh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. First, Oh, we're the Ministry of Music, sorry. <laughs> sorry about the sorry stuff in this service today. <laughs> and this is also, if you wish to follow the words, it's Make Me a Channel of Your Peace, oh, and it's number 684 in the hymn book. It goes along with today's scripture, if you will listen. <laughs> Mother's Day, except you don't spend as much money. <laughs> <laughs> we just have to tie all these things together. <laughs> well, look, our, our, our scriptures, uh, there are two scripture readings today. One is from Romans 13, and the second one you will learn is from Matthew. Romans and Matthews are tied together in their theme, and, uh, and Janet has tied this beautifully with the uh, making a channel of peace, because that's where we, we have to go today. Anyway, Romans uh, 13, verses 8 through 14. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandments there are, are summed up in this one rule. 
love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is near now, uh, is near more now than we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, nor sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think uh, about how to gratify the desires of your sinful nature. It's quite a long list of things that we have to keep in mind. And then we go to Matthew chapter 18 and we get a similar theme to be presenting. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I hope you'll join me. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as if you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, it will be loosened in heaven. And so we have two different uh, approaches to the same issue, and that's where Tom Watson has come in this morning. Tom has uh, reflected on this particular idea in his, uh, his remarkable presentations of sermons. And so we're going to our town. We've been there before. We enjoy our visits, of course. And today we want to think about a family we've not heard about before, the Julian family. They'll come to you in a minute. And it's also done, Tom's work was done during a time of September. So it reflects those kinds of things. And you know how we begin. Well, it's been busy in our town. It always is at the first of, December, uh, of September. It's just when folks are coming back from their summer vacations at the cottage. And they're running around trying to figure out how do you get back onto the routine that we left back in perhaps June. And others, of course, are busy already doing um, fall canning. Some people are doing painting of the house that, well, they should have done before they left, but they didn't. Stuff like that. Now, the Julian family that I mentioned, they have a wedding at the end of September. And on Thursday evening, this past week, everybody was put on red alert. Do you realize how much there is to do in the last three weeks, Teresa said, at the evening uh, dinner? Well, no, no, they really hadn't. And so when Bob and Brian and Ginger took a look up and gave her kind of a, a blank stare, Teresa lost it. And she served every, a great due notice that if, even if they didn't realize it, they were coming down to the wire. And there was so much, many, many details to attend to and tie up, and she wasn't going to be the one to tie them all. Now, downstairs in the family room, she continued, you're going to find a list. It's on the wall right by the patio door. And I've taken the liberty of assigning each of you a task, and I expect it to be done. Got it? Well, it was hard not to get it. Bob mumbled something other, well, Maybe this is kind of an overreaction. And it's a little bit too early to panic. But that wasn't very helpful. And so for the rest of the meal, you could have heard a piece of spaghetti drop to the plate. And for the rest of the evening, and even into the next day, it was not 
monastery silence so that Julian's have their hands full. Now, September is also school time, isn't it? School teachers have been busy this week as well in our town. They're getting used to the crop of new kids. And the kids have been busy. Well, they always write stories about what I did on my summer vacation. Hazel Newport, we haven't met her before. But Hazel, she's been teaching grade five for nearly 30 years. And so she's read about 40,000 of these writings and she's beginning to wish, well, a little bit more variety would be helpful. So she's thinking of maybe she's going to pay for a few of her vacations for herself, and then she could read about something new. Down at the cafe, of course, we always visit the cafe, the old, old coffee shop at Al's. They've been busy as well. They're solving the world's problems, and they do awfully well at that course. Too bad some of the world leaders don't drop into the coffee shop. They could learn a whole bunch, get a lot of free advice, but they haven't arrived yet. Yep, the old guys are pretty good at solving problems <coughs> anywhere in the world. But where they're stuck right now is close to home. They've got a problem that reaches right inside the coffee shop gang. The problem is Hank Vickers and Fred Barlow. They've been on the outs for nearly six weeks. It all started, so I'm told, back in July when Hank Vickers decided to trim the hedge. That all sounds pretty straightforward. Until you know that the hedge he decided to trim runs right down through the center of the property between Vickers and Barlow. Still doesn't sound like much of a deal until you know that this is a common hedge. It was put there just like neighbors often put up a fence between two pieces of property. It's a mutual property divider and we understand that. But it's still hard to understand what the problem is until you know further that Hank trimmed it down to about four inches from the ground. <laughs> from where it started off at five feet tall. And he did this trim job while Fred and Cindy Barber were away on vacation. So without consulting them. Now in his defense, Hank offered that the hedge had gotten pretty ratty looking. That he had an expert come over and have a look at it and the expert decided that there might be a blight in the hedge. And so the best way to solve it was cut it down low and then give it time and it will regrow and it will solve the problem. So he took the advice of the expert and he really had good intentions. But you see, this was a common property hedge, which meant that as far as Fred Barlow was concerned, that he had a right to be part of the decision. Not only that, but any ratty looking hedge must have been on the vicar's side, <laughs> because from his side it looked pretty good. And he had no idea that Hank was going to be calling in a hedge expert. Well, Hank and Fred have been good neighbors for a long time. And pretty good neighbors, in fact, in fact, both can still remember the days, about 10 years ago, when they worked side by side with picks and shovels and they dug a trench with a new hedge. And throughout the years, they've been good neighbors. And they've done a lot of good things together and they were always quick to help one another. And here they are. Bad feelings hang like a cloud over where the hedge used to be. Fred's upset because, well, Hank made this unilateral decision about the hedge. And Hank's upset because he thought Fred would trust his judgment about who needed the hedge to be cut down. And Cindy Barlow, well, she's tried to convince Fred 
that no hedge is worth losing a good friend over. And if you leave it alone, it'll come back. It might take a year or so, but it will respond. And Mildred Vickers, she's tried to convince Hank, well, maybe he should go over and apologize. Maybe, maybe for not consulting me. But neither will budge. <clears throat> for both of them, it's a matter of principle. Fred says, good neighbors are not like that. They have more respect for things that are, you know, half owned by somebody else. I just never thought Hank Vickers would do something like that. I guess it shows exactly who he really is. And Hank says, good neighbors are not like that. They don't get upset over something as meaningless as a hedge. I just never believe Fred Barlow would be so stupid and stubborn. Looks like I've misjudged him all these years. And so it goes on. They haven't spoken now for six weeks. And the last week or so, they don't even go out in their own yards at the same time. Neither of them now comes down to Al's coffee shop in the morning as they used to do. And the rest of the old guys really miss their company. Which means that everybody's hurting. Hank and Fred, because, well, they're on the outs. And the rest of the coffee shop crew, because they seem powerless to offer help. And Frank Burstead, we know him. Why is it? that we know exactly what our Prime Minister and our Premier should do in Ottawa and in Toronto, but we don't have a clue of how to help Hank and Fred. And that's the news from our town this week, at least from the stories I heard. Tell me, what would you do if you were Fred Barlow? And your neighbor cut down your hedge that was half yours without asking. And what would you do if you were Hank Vickers and had too much pride to tell your neighbor that you're sorry? Especially even if you don't think you did anything wrong. And what would you do if you were Cindy Barlow or Mildred Vickers or one of the guys at the coffee shop? You ache for their friend's return. And you wish they would just sit down and solve the problem. And you can't seem to do anything to help them fix it. And the question then is, what do you do when there's a problem between you and someone else? And I suspect that most of us know what that's about. Most of us have probably had odds between well, a neighbor, a friend, maybe even a spouse, or someone, at some place, sometime, in another situation. You know, every time I've read Tom's work, I think he's talking to me. Our gospel reading suggests that we might even sometime get us with one another in the church. Oh. What do we do then? Look, says Tom, I want to level with you last Tuesday when I looked at these lectionary passages and wanted to run away and not choose to do something with them. Why? Well, because Paul talks about our need to love our neighbor. And I want to pretend that we don't need to hear that again because we already do love our at least as well as we are able. And Matthew sets down a formula for dealing with differences between church members. And I'd like to pretend we don't have to do that either because there's never any conflict among us because, after all, this is the church and we're Christians. And you know what I mean. And so when I read Matthew's 
prescriptions, I don't even want to talk to you about them. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out that fault when the two of you are alone. And if the other one listens to you, if, if in other words, if there's listening and there's understanding and you can work it out, well, then you've regained one, haven't you? In other words, you're restoring right relationships. But if you're not listened to, take one other or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. The point here is, let's be sure that it's oh, we're all clear about what the problem is. No rumors and no facts. It's just only facts. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the whole church, let such a one to you become a Gentile or a tax collector. Tom comes back in. Well, let's admit it. First of all, there are problems with this text. The first problem is in the very first line. It says, if another member of the church sins against you, sins against you. The assumption, of course, is that the fault lies with the other person. There's the sinner and you. Frankly, says Tom, I have encountered very few situations where the problem is totally one-sided. The dispute between Hank Vickers and Fred Barbo may sound one-sided. It isn't one-sided. No matter who does what, it takes two to make a quarrel. And as the old saying says, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Where the text is right is in saying that it takes two to settle the quarrel. None of us can do that alone. So the text quite rightly invites us to focus on what we can do to patch things up and to restore those right relationships. But what do you do when you've tried everything you know of and nothing's been solved? What do you do after you've followed every one of Matthew's steps and there's no mutual understanding and there's no seemingly solution to the problem? Here's the second problem in connection with this text. But here the problem isn't with the text, rather, it's in the understanding of what it says. The text says, when everything else has failed, let that one, that sinner, be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. What we've generally understood is, let the other one be a Gentile. What does this mean? Well, my sense is, we've already understood what it means. It says, okay, I've done everything I could. It's time to part company. Get out of my face. It's too bad, but we're finished. Frankly, says Tom, the understanding is wrong. And here's why. And it's really the message that we have to focus on. And Janet's uh, presentation this morning was making a channel of peace. Jesus did not relate to Gentiles and tax collectors by shunning them, by parting company with them? No. He did the most intimate thing possible in his society at that time. He sat down at the table and he ate with them. He treated them with great and the utmost hospitality. And he knew that the other person, not just as much as he, that person, was a child of God. Well, it's not easy. But the point is that just at the moment when we're tempted to give up, that's precisely the moment when we are invited to treat the other as a Gentile or a tax collector and 
find any way to relate to them with love and respect and to reclaim that neighbor or that friend. Tom says, they really didn't want to talk to you about these conflicts today because there's so many other things that we could talk about. But who knows? Who really knows? It may come in handy somewhere along the road just at least to have thought of it. What would you do? enjoy your leadership from the, from the pulpit. Thanks to okay. Healing begins with truth and reconciliation. In late October 2022, the federal government recognized the res regis uh, re residential uh, school system as an act of genocide against Canada's indigenous peoples. It was a reminder that we are still very much on the path to reconciliation and healing. 
we know that we have had an impact, as the United Church of Canada <coughs> says, Reverend Murray Pruden. He is Nahiya Cree First Nations from the Good Fish Lake and Saddle Lake First Nations and is the current Executive Minister for Indigenous Ministries and Justice for the United Church of Canada. Supported by mission and service, Pruden has made significant gains in building relationships of trust and healing between the church and the indigenous communities. After unmarked graves were discovered in Kamloops, BC in 2021, the United Church gave an additional three million to help indigenous communities respond, mourn, heal, and potentially find other unmarked graves. Why? Because we believe every child matters. The funds also supported the dedication of the memorials to lost children, like one for a BC community that raised a totem pole, funded in part by Mission and Service. Other healing initiatives include the translation of the Mohawk Language Bible, the Food for the North Program, Healing Circles, and programs for Indigenous youth to learn and reclaim their languages. Pruden stresses the need for patience. Ever since Kamloops, we had many non-Indigenous church communities and people ask what they can do or how they can contribute in different ways. And we at the time really kind of put our hands up and said, whoa, we need, we need a bit of a pause here, a minute, for us to mourn. I think that we still have so much to give, to teach, and to be in relationship with. And as long as we have a greater understanding within the church and the supports we can give, relationships, friendships, understanding and trust, these are the foundations of the work Mission and Service is doing across Turtle Island, thanks to your generosity. We come together to thank God for our blessing and to offer our gifts so that the ministry of this church will continue to grow. Thank you for sharing your gifts. We offer them to God in gratitude and praise. We listen for you, O God, 
to show us hope that does not disappoint. Gathered together, listening, we pray for compassion. We pray for the tender-hearted who give until nothing is left. We pray for the alienated and excluded who need our solidarity more than our charity. We pray for anyone and everyone who feels like a sheep without a shepherd. We listen for you, O God, to show us hope that does not disappoint. God, make us wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Listen with us, listen to us, listen through us for hope that brings peace. Prove that your love is more than our best efforts, but a grace that brings the lightness of laughter. Pour your love into our hearts so that we can know your peace. Gathered together, we pray in your hope. Amen. The departing hymn is like a rock. Say goodbye to the uh, say goodbye to the Facebook uh, live people, and then we'll go to the video. What was that? We'll say goodbye to the Facebook people, and we'll go to the video. Oh, say goodbye. <laughs> okay. Goodbye, Facebook people. <laughs> <laughs>